Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Jill Vianmaitri Dupre. I'm the interim director of the Atlas Institute, and it's my pleasure to, in, to, in, uh, to welcome you to tonight's event, which is co-sponsored by Silicon Flatirons, Atlas, and tonight the Boulder Software Club. Uh, for those who haven't been to Entrepreneurs Unplugged before, it's storytelling with a point. So we like to think that it brings together people from diverse backgrounds to learn more about and get more involved in entrepreneurship through the stories of a successful entrepreneur. Uh, in terms of format, we'll do live Q&A by the moderators for until about 7.30, and then we'll open it up to 15 minutes of audience questions. Um, our tradition is to have you turn and just briefly introduce you introduce yourself to somebody sitting near you. I think a lot of you have been doing that for a while, so we'll be really short, but it's kind of a preview for the reception that'll follow. I'm going to move on, but I do encourage you to finish up these conversations in the reception right afterwards. Uh, how many of you, raise your hands if this is the first time you've been to an Entrepreneurs Unplugged? Wow. Okay, that's great. Uh, how about if you're a student? Okay. Faculty? Entrepreneurs? Wonderful. Um, I have just a few announcements before we get to the main course. Uh, some of you know that we had an Entrepreneurs Unplugged scheduled for right after the flood, and we postponed that. So on October 21st, John Giacomoni and Manish Vacharajani, the founders of LineRight, uh, will be here in Atlas. It starts at 6.15, same format as tonight. Um, I also wanted to introduce Remy. Remy Artiaga, will you stand up? Uh, so Remy's the new director of outreach for the Deming Center for Entrepreneurship. Um, and try and find him afterwards and introduce yourself. We're thrilled to have Remy on board. Remy, we'll get you a shirt. And then Richard Bass. Where'd you go, Richard? Oh, stand up. So Richard has been such an incredible partner to us in putting on this series. I think this is the fourth time we've partnered with the software club, and it's, each time it's been just incredible. So we're thrilled to see so many new faces um, and grateful to Richard for putting that on. Uh, and if you want to say anything? It's a great forum. It's not only it's informative, but it's also a lot of fun. And it's good to hear the stories. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and then are there any audience announcements? Anything entrepreneurship related that you want to plug? Go ahead, mystery. Hi, I'm Mr. Murphy. I'm a fellow with the Silicon Flatiron Center, and coming up on October 30th, we're having the New Venture Challenge Pitch Night. Um, pitch Night is a really awesome opportunity where students and young companies will come and pitch their ideas. Uh, it's a really fun event. If you have an idea, come and pitch it. CUNBC.org for registration and more information. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Nate. Uh, there's a, an event November 13th to the 15th called Startup Phenomenon. Um, 
listening to and love uh, Brad and Brad is speaking there again. And yeah, check it out. Start from now. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Elise. I'm from Dalton, Colorado. We're having an event this Thursday at Inversed. It's Oktoberfest, built in brews, and it's a great chance to meet other people from the startup and entrepreneurial community in Denver. Great. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, uh, this morning, uh, Rally Software uh, had a big event. Um, it was their 1% uh, give back event. When Rally got started a decade ago, they contributed 1% of the company to the Entrepreneurs Foundation of Colorado. Um, Rally went public uh, about six months ago. Um, the stock is coming off lockup at the end of this week. And the gift that they gave to uh, Entrepreneurs Foundation, Community Foundation, and then a fund called uh, Rally for Impact uh, totaled $1.3 million. Um, it's a great example. Ryan, Ma Ryan Martins, who's the CTO and founder of Rally, along with a couple of others of us, started Entrepreneurs Foundation of Colorado. This was the first major gift. There have been lots of six-figure gifts, $100,000 type gifts. This is the first seven-figure gift. I shouldn't say major. First seven-figure gift. Um, and this is what we envisioned. And at the time that the gift was given, Rally was three people. So just to give a sense of what it can turn into, any of you who have startups and are interested in learning more about Entrepreneurs Foundation of Colorado, just email me, bradedfeld.com. I'll get you plugged into the right folks. But it's a, it was a pretty proud day for everybody uh, in the Colorado software and entrepreneurial community because it's – uh, a great successful startup that's giving back to the community that's helped it be successful. Okay, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our featured entrepreneur tonight, Luke Beatty. Uh, Luke is the head of strategic partnerships at AOL. In 2005, he founded Associated Contact. Content, which was acquired by Yahoo in 2010 and is known as the web's first crowdsourced publishing platform. Um, he also served as vice president and general manager at Yahoo, where he oversaw local, Flickr, groups, and the Yahoo Contributor Network, um, which was an evolution of associated content. He then served as managing director of Techstars, which is near and dear to our heart. Uh, before moving to AOL. He's recognized for his knowledge around entrepreneurship, digital media, crowdsourcing strategies, and venture capital, um, and is an advisor to numerous startups, which I won't list, but I will say I was most impressed by being an advisor to his son's preschool. All right. It takes the most time. <laughs> um, and was selected as one of the business journals 40 under 40, and is an avid fly fisherman and lacrosse player. So. A big warm welcome to Luke. <laughs> and I'll hand things over to our capable moderators, Brad Feld, who's the managing director of Foundry Group, and Brad Bernthal, a professor at the law school and the director of the Entrepreneurship Initiative within Silicon Patterns. So my, my first question is uh, a very high level one, you know, given your new role at AOL. Uh, what mail client do you use? I use Voxer. Voxer, no mail, yeah. just all I'm, Voxer. I'm, I'm trying to move everybody. Convert all I'm of the move everybody on the planet away from keying in anything. Um, but uh, I, I, I realized that it, it's so strange at, at AOL that I figured if I signed up for a uh, an AOL instant messenger account, which is as you can imagine, how they like to think that people have, that the company are going to communicate with one another. That I could also use that same user ID for an for an email account. No, no. no. those <laughs> two things those two things haven't haven't met each other yet. So they may they may never have met. They may never meet, and that that'll be interesting. But I think there are actually people that are that are working on that. You're pretty you're pretty good you're pretty good with the Vox, though. Know? Yeah, I like that. So so serious starting point is um, when did you first start thinking about playing around with getting involved in entrepreneurship? What was the arc early in your career, early in your life, where the idea of doing your own thing first came about? Uh, well, I think that when I graduated from college, I had, 
I sort of had it in my mind that I wanted to work in um, somewhere around digital media and search and that whole kind of thing, which basically Im implied that, that you'd be at a startup, right? So What was the time frame? What year? Oh, like 1997, kind of 98. And it was sort of like if you wanted to get involved in that kind of a thing, then you were going to be at a, at a startup. So I would say that I was more uh, interested in, the, in, in, in being involved in that, uh, which by default meant that you weren't probably going to be working at a big company, uh, that you probably weren't going to have uh, the luxuries of, of, of some kind of a big company job, and that um, it was, it was going to be more of an entrepreneurial sort of uh, work experience that I was, I was looking at, you know, I think. So college to what? What was that first job? So the well, the, my first job out of college. While I was in college, my parents uh, were pretty horrified that I was getting a liberal arts degree, and I was. Hey, your gonna, dad's a lawyer, right? So yeah. he's like, you know, you will be a lawyer. He actually, that was the one thing he said not. You to will be. not be a lawyer. But I, but he did. You'll be a doctor. <laughs> he, but he just couldn't believe that I was going to graduate with an anthropology degree, uh, with no intention of being an anthropologist. That was just something that was like unbelievable that I would proceed with that, and so. I, of course, was, my instinct was to argue with him about it, uh, but then there was, it, there, there was a lot of good... Was it a loud argument? Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, but it made a lot of good sense, and so I decided that the only thing that I could do where I was in school, where I would actually have something that would permission me to do something else afterward, where I could get, get paid, was to get my teaching certificate. So, um, and I was a, uh, a lacrosse player, and I had lots of opportunity to coach uh, lacrosse, and so... I sort of used that as I'll get my teaching certificate uh, as an undergrad so that then I will at least have something that I would be prepared to have a job with afterwards. Um, so I did that for a couple of years. Um, and then after that, when did you teach? I taught uh, um, AP US history and economics, which was really because they wanted me to be the lacrosse coach. So it's sort of like a, sort of like a tuck in. Right. Uh, Here's some shitty class that somebody yeah. has to teach. Yeah, although it was like, you know, I mean, the kids that were in AP U.S. history were serious about that. Uh, so I needed, to, I needed to brush up on that, at least, at least a day in advance of every uh, lecture. Can you tell us something interesting that happened in 1829? No, no, nope. Not anymore. I wasn't, I wasn't alive then. <laughs> uh, um, and so... Then I then I realized I was going to move back to Colorado and, and try to try to work at startups. So I um, went to every single startup in in town and in here too in Boulder and in Denver. <clears throat> and you know one good thing about teaching is while I forfeited the opportunity to coach a bunch of summer lacrosse camps, which I'd been doing for a bunch of years, I uh, you know I would get paid for the summer. So I I, I went to like. 17, I think went to 17 different startups and just knocked on the door of every single one of them. And none of them, I, I didn't really know that many people. I, I, I knew some friends of friends, kind of, that was, everything was more than one arm's length away from me at that point. And I were, just went in and I said, can I work here all summer for free? And I'll do whatever you want me to do. And, um, and so finally, uh, this, this guy who was a, a friend of a friend, um, was said sure, and uh, so I started working at this company um, in Denver called Wand, which is still there. It was a very unique, um, privately held, um, small boutique search provider company that really specialized in building taxonomies for Google and Yahoo and all these different people. And this is you know when Google first started, the searches were about. Um, you know, it was just text matching. Is there an article um, in, in the digital world that, where these words match these words? It was strict matching. And then the next level of that became to be having sort of uh, more far-reaching relationships. So if you'd have said um, solicitor, you might have meant lawyer. Or if you said lawyer, you might have meant attorney. And, and building out a relational databases of words. And so I was basically like a, a word salesman. And uh, so... I really worked my ass off, and it was a lot of ontologists and taxonomy people who were just total, um, you know, not 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 Mr. and Mrs. Outside for sure, definitely <laughs> in, in, indoor indoor people. 
And uh, people, people need a lot of sunscreen if they went outside. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and maybe a, some, some bathing. Uh, and, uh, but I, it was great because I understood. You right in. Yeah. <laughs> Tons of friends. And, uh, but it was great. I had a huge opportunity. And they were like, this guy gets it. And he will go out and talk to these people. And so I did that. Um, I don't know how much of the story you want, but it, there's, a, there's a funny part to it, which is the whole time I'm thinking to myself, like, okay, like, I, I'm going to have to sort of pop the question here and, you know, say at the end of the summer, like, do you have a job for me? And because I had to tell the school district, and even this was to really almost uh, borderline unprofessional, but there is a, you have a two-week period uh, in August in which you can bail. And... Uh, so I went to my boss, who was this guy named K.T. Mao, who was this uh, guy who was like a, you know, really serious CFO kind of guy. And uh, I never really hung out with the CEO and the founder ever. I mean, I was in a couple meetings with him, but he was kind of a back office guy. And, uh, and so I had a meeting in the morning with K.T., and I, I had coffee with him. I said, listen, you know, like, can I have a job? Because I either got to tell my school I'm going back to school or take this job. He's like, you've got a job. I was like, yes, and I, I did like what I was doing. I was like basically on the road in Silicon Valley all the time, meeting people, and it was just like the best entry-level job I could ever have dreamed of. Um, and went to lunch, came back from lunch, and this place was like a, like a, it, was, it was silent in that office all the time. I mean, there were nobody, no meetings, nobody talking, nobody fighting. Nothing going on, just people there, just terminals, like translating words or looking up words, just doing their own work with headphones on. And I came in from lunch, and I heard KT, who had a very, very strong accent, in the back office with the CEO having this insane fight. And I was like, oh, my God, this action here. <laughs> and uh, I was, uh, I like a lot of action. And so I realized, like, this is great. And then the door slams, and KT comes out. Falls out of the office, grabs his bag, and looks at me and goes, good luck. I'm leaving. I just got fired. <laughs> and I had, during my lunch break, called the school to tell them I was out. <laughs> so I had basically, the guy who gave me a job had, like, basically been fired, like, within two hours after giving me the job. <laughs> so then I had army crawl back in there and basically introduce myself, and I decided to tell them that I was a new employee. <laughs> which was sort of hard to do, but that was my first job. Did you keep the job? I did. I kept the job for three years, yeah. Cool. So yeah. what happened? Did you, did you run screaming out of the building one day? No. I just realized that I could start a company that would, make a, would be able to make a lot of money, you know, and I, was, I wasn't one of these people like we see often here in Boulder who was just looking for, like, a startup, you know, and was like, I've got to do a startup. I want to do a startup either as a founder or as, a, um, as an employee or whatever. I mean, I, I very much was the founder who an opportunity just, like, dumped itself in, in my lap. Like, I saw how the product would work, and I was, like, I, I was 100% sure it, was, it would be successful, which I think is, is pretty rare. You know, I wasn't sort of the person looking for a problem, kind of. So how did the problem find you? So in the process of working with all these search engines, half of the reason why they were coming to us and asking for expanded taxonomy, so they would come to us and they would say something like, give me all of the words that have anything to do with the plastics industry, right? And so we would go back and, um, and we would put this whole relational database together of every single word in the plastics industry. And then there were all these different ways to upsell it, like, and then you want to translate it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the reason why they were doing that was because the content that was available on the web at the time that had been basically digitized or either conceived originally in a digital format or had been changed from print to, to digital was really thin. You know, I mean, search was going a million miles an hour and content creation was basically, they were just looking for old things to scan kind of thing. I mean, it was, you had a, you, you had like an, a, a Ferrari with no real road system kind of thing. And so, um, but so what, half of the reason why these people were looking for more words was because they wanted to give you something else. Because what you really wanted didn't exist. 
So when you'd do some, you know, kind of, well, we wouldn't call it deep query right now, but back then you'd go to Google and you'd search like, you know, uh, uh, some extended car part and then the year model and then a bunch of four or five other things. There was basically nothing there, right? So because it used to be a straight word-to-word -word search, and if it didn't exist, they didn't. They never wanted to show you no results, right? That was like, and people here may not remember. Raise your hand if you remember getting no results. Like that's that's an, well, that's an old person would recognize that. But you used to get no results all the time. Uh, now you don't get any no results. But part of that was because they would sort of point you to a, something that was like a, re a, a related thing. Um, like I said, a, a synonym, we knew words with synonyms or different, you know, you search for a different model. Well, if you don't have anything on a 76, you know, uh, Ford Caprice or whatever, we'll send you to a 75 Ford Caprice. But, but you need a database to redirect people to do that. But I start to look at, so all I did was look at search queries all day long. And I realized, like, there's no content in all these places. And if the content gets created, this is how many pages it's going to get because I know how many queries it's getting. And this is what I know that people are willing to advertise on that page, right? So that's a pretty easy math problem to get yourself involved in, which even I could do. And, um, and so I realized, like, I can just build a, a, a massive publishing platform um, that will allow anybody to publish audio, video, text, images on any topic. And I can also have an assignment desk where people can claim assignments. And I will build a massive community of people who create content. They can create whatever they want. But I can also, the stuff that I assign them to create, and I might even pay them up front, I know I'm going to make money on it. Because I know every day 465 people search on this. If we create this piece of content, it will at least be on the first page, if not the only result after a while. <laughs> and that will be this many clicks. And I knew every click-through rate for every type of thing. And I knew that. And then you know, also I knew what, what advertising rates were at that time. And I could just put those two together. So that's why I started the company. If a student comes up and has a similar, I know I want to get into startups, I don't have to be the founder, would you recommend this path today in terms of volunteering your time, or are there other paths that you'd recommend at this point? Um, yeah, I think so. I think um, you know, volunteering your time is something that's great for the volunteer. And if you're the supervisor, it's kind of a tough road, right? Because, you know, when you're a founder, you, you want people who are really committed and really kind of engaged. So sometimes those people come in all shapes and sizes and colors, but oftentimes volunteers who don't have a high level of give a shit can sometimes come over the, uh, come over the transom. So I think, you know, I think it's a great way to, I don't know of another way to get involved if you, if you were like me and you had zero experience, didn't really know that many people. I knew a few people. Um, uh, but didn't really know that many people. Like I think you know, it's hard for somebody to say no when you come in and you ask them if you work for them for free. Um, it's a question of more of can you manage them, you know? How many of the 17 companies did you have to go through before you got somebody to say yes? Uh, I definitely only got one yes. And I think I probably went through like all seventeen of them. Right. So not. But most of them were like, most of them were like, yeah, but like, I, you know, it was like sort of like backing your truck in and asking if you need some mulch. Like I could definitely use some mulch, but maybe not like right now. Kind of thing. <laughs> so everybody needed. Everybody was like, sure, I'll meet with a bunch of people and we'll find something for you to do. But can you come back in, in two weeks? And at that point, that's like. You know, a lot of my summer is that two weeks, so it was a matter of just kind of more finding somebody who would be um, who would be interested in that. So, so what was the start of the company? So, you have this idea, you you're a hundred percent sure it's going to work. What was the first thirty days? Well, the the first day that you start a company is usually the day that you quit your other job. So I went into the same guy who was got into a shouting match with my direct boss and I he was in the same business and I, I, I was even his, I was a little afraid that he was going to want to get in on this business with me because I told him what I was I wanted to go do so I asked him if he would put into writing that I could have my job back in 60 in six months and he was like uh, okay 
And so I handed him a napkin for him to sign that said I could have my job back in six months. And I guess that's really when I, I would say this. I started the company, which was actually in 2004, sort of the day that you, you quit your other job. Uh, some people would say it's when you like release a product to the public or you have an alpha product or whatever. But for me, it was basically when I quit my job. Um, but I also didn't really have anything to lose. I had a dog, basically. Um, so, uh, you know, that's how it that's how it sort of started. Um, and then I think more actively, when when Associated Content started, was when I I started a raid on the um, Denver Post and Rocky Mountain News CMS builders, right? So the um, out of the Rocky Mountain News office, uh, which is probably most of you don't know, heard of that, but that was a newspaper um, in Denver. Uh, they, they ran the content management system for tons of newspapers around the country. And it was a pretty good, uh, it was a pretty good, pretty good group. And what I wanted to build was sort of the same thing, like a platform where lots of people from all over the world would be able to come into one CMS. They could also get assignments on what things they wanted to do. And I didn't know a single person over there. Um, so I, but that was the only thing in town. I definitely wanted to be working with engineers and product people locally. So I, I literally just hung out outside of that break room <laughs> over at the Rocky Mountain News and would ask people, like, what do you do? What do you do? Like, who's your boss? Like, and uh, basically within a week, I found that the guy, the lead front end guy and the lead back end guy who's building the CMS for, uh, for the Rocky Mountain News and tons of different newspapers. And, uh, and basically, you know, told them about this idea because I knew that they would get the idea and that they would also get what needed to be built. Um, and I was really serious about building it in Cold Fusion. And uh, something also like the Rocky Mountain News you probably have never heard of, but uh, and, and they did that too. At what point did you decide that you needed additional outside funding? And I know that you were borderline stalking someone in Silicon Valley. Maybe you can just forward on that. Well, I was more interested in. Um, I was in a unique situation because um, I had enough people within friends and family that I could build the business and get it off the ground. Um, my interest in raising more money was, like much of my entire career, was trying to be able to make it so that I could keep my business in Colorado. Um, I needed to get some people who were not Denver people who were real media people in New York and real startup um, folks uh, in Silicon Valley interested in what I was doing. Um, I knew that I could build the product, but I I wasn't I wasn't the, I wasn't feeling like I could just do go it alone out here uh, in Colorado. Um, so I basically went um, I just went after. Um, all of the like top name people that I could possibly find just completely bl as blind as I could be. The one person that I did have in my corner is Tim Armstrong, who's, who's now my boss, who was my roommate all through college. And um, uh, he's now the CEO of, of, of AOL. He and I are roommates in college and after college, played lacrosse together and did everything together. And he was working at Google uh, at this time, running sales, um, he ended up being the president of North America before he left. But he um, he was making insane amounts of money at Google at this time, at least relatively. Um, he managed to crush all of those records later. But um, but between I'd I'd sold my house so that I would have some money, and he was willing to put in some money. So we just not having a couple hundred thousand dollars. We had that money. Um, but I wanted to get other people involved that were just sort of higher level people who would provide the company with some um, some exposure the same way you would do something like tech stars or you know get a notable investor or, or, or whatever you might do get an advisor or something like that so um, so the, f the first person that I went after who I'd met once before uh, was uh, we were talking about was was Ron Conway who at the time was basically you know, the major well-known sort of 
A-list kind of uh, um, angel investor in, uh, in Silicon Valley at the time. And he'd been <coughs> first money in on Google and all, everything. Uh, and, um, and I knew I really wanted to have some sort of presence out there, although I wasn't really going to be there. Uh, and I figured that he would not be interested in it, but he might, you know, my feeling is that for people that were in tech stars with me, you know, my, my, my philosophy is go after the exact person that you want, the actual exact person that you want, and you probably won't get that person, but that person definitely knows the, the next closest person. So that was my, my approach. So I called and emailed Ron like 20 or 30 times and was sort of like, hey, you know, you don't know me and I don't know you, but I want to introduce you to my startup and all this sort of stuff. And. And he never, uh, he, he only responds even to this day or even in an emergency situation with really sort of like one or two word email responses. Uh, and he would always say, okay. <laughs> they would respond, okay, or something. I'd be like, all right, so then when are we going to meet? You know, and that never really happened. And I kept calling and meeting with him. At the same time, though, we have a little bit of a product being developed here. Like things are sort of moving along. And then... Um, and, uh, and so then I, uh, I finally got a call from his assistant, and she said, uh, you can meet Ron tomorrow at some Italian restaurant in Palo Alto at 11 or at 1.30. And I was said, okay, that's excellent news. And uh, so I scraped together some of my old man's uh, frequent flyer miles and <laughs> shot out there with my little, you know, printed out. PowerPoint deck and um, showed up at this Italian restaurant and um, I was supposed to meet him at 1.30 and 2.45 rolled around and there was no, no, no Ron Conway and, uh, and my flight was going to leave at like 4 o'clock so that, did, that didn't seem like it was going to work out and then I basically paid for my 13 glasses of iced tea and five trips to the urinal and uh, and roll, rolled out and was walking down the block and then I saw Ron coming who if you don't never if you know who he is he's just sort of like a very he's an incredible sort of character avuncular right? yeah I mean he's like a hundred bags over a guy with like a gray hair who's you know chortling and you know he's a real piece of work so he comes in and we sit down and he starts talking to me about things that have nothing to do with anything that I know anything about. <laughs> Brad's. I've had that thing. conversation. You've had that conversation. <laughs> I think everyone who's had a conversation has had that conversation. And, um, and so we sit back down at the same table that I had just vacated. And he reaches in his bag and he pulls out the Facebook basically kind of series A angel sort of deck. And he says, let's go over this. I just met with this kid named Mark Zuckerberg. Let's go over this deck. And so he like pours over this. We have this long discussion about it. And I had gone to Harvard, so he felt like I had to have, would have a really elucidated opinion about whether that was going to work out. And I kept telling him over and over that I thought it was a terrible idea. Uh, I must have told him that 50 times. And, um, and then basically, like, and 15, uh, 15 minutes left in the meeting, um, he's like, so is there anything else you wanted to go over? And I was like, well, I didn't even, I didn't even want to go over that. That has nothing to do with it. <laughs> Uh, why? And he goes, oh, I thought my assistant told me that you wanted to go over that, you know, and I said, no, I, what I want to tell you about is, is my business, uh, which I'm starting, and he said, okay, great, and he said, well, where are you from? And you know, I'm like, Denver, and he said, well, I don't invest in companies outside of Silicon Valley, which he didn't do at the time, and uh, I said, well, that's, that's fine, because I just want you to sit on the board, and he was like, I've invested in however many companies at that point in time, hundreds of startups, and I've never sat on any boards. And I'm certainly not going to sit on your board. I don't, I, he knew who Tim was, but he's like, other than Tim, I don't know anybody that's involved with it, and I don't sit on boards, and it will set a horrible precedent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, and then I started, well, I was like, well, let me explain to you what I'm doing, which is sort of like kind of, 
a tech stars kind of interview. Like, can I just tell you, dude, what I want to tell you, what I want to do? And so I told him that. And he's like, oh, I think that's a really great idea. But I, I'm, I, and then he was like, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll write you a check. And I was, and I was like, why? Well, I, I don't. I, and then I was like, hmm, this is a tough call because I, I really wanted him to be involved. But I also told him that I figured if I, I kind of felt like if I caved on what I came to ask for, and so okay, instead of saying on the board, I'll take your money, that I wouldn't seem as sort of like passionate or focused on what it is that I wanted to get out of him. And so I was basically like, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want the money. I really want you to sit on the board. And he was like, well, that's just never going to happen. And it was sort of an awkward ending of meeting. And then, <laughs> and then I flew back. And I was actually, because I never even thought the meeting was going to happen, I, I was practically in a cab on my way. That I actually had the meeting, felt super successful, and felt like I was a really successful entrepreneur at that point in time. <laughs> and then he called me like two days later, and he's like, I'll sit on the board. <laughs> And it's still to this day the only board. He's actually now he's on the board of the of, of UCLA, but it's the only board he's ever sat on. That's an awesome stalker. <laughs> <laughs> how much did he? How much did he invest? Uh, he ended up investing once it got successful a little bit down the road. I don't know whether I don't know how much he put in. He put it in through some fund, and I think he only put in like a couple hundred thousand bucks. Was he was he a good board member? He was a really great board member because, you know, as a board member, you either need people for tactical reasons or you need people to just, like, strong-arm people and do what you do. And, um, <laughs> and uh, he was that guy, you know, because he could really call in favors, you know. I mean, he could get you any meeting you wanted. He was very, he's very much the kind of guy who could just get you any sort of introduction that you wanted. He doesn't know anything about anything, so he wouldn't be able to detail what, what that meeting would be about or a specific ask or anything like that. But he was definitely the guy who could give you the opportunity to do your thing. Do your thing. Yeah. And he was, even to the end, even to this day, you know, I mean, I had, uh, I had lunch with him last week in San Francisco, and he's, he's still that guy. Like, he, whatever you need, he's that guy. And he's one of these people who, he's getting older now, so he's more, you know, like my old man, like he's ins like, uh, unbelievably obsessed with random political topics. Uh, <laughs> but he uh, has he become he has not yet because I know his political leanings. Unlike my father, who is now a Glenn Beck acolyte, yeah, he has not. I try to explain to my father that Glenn Beck wants all the Jews killed. My father says those are the other Jews he wants killed, not me. Right. <laughs> Um, he agrees, <laughs> but just not the ones that you're talking about. Um, so, so, uh, so you get some money from Ron. Mm -hmm. You put together a, a, a little bit of financing. The business is starting to make some progress. Right. What's the what's the sort of you know uh, early growth time? You know, up to maybe 20 people feel like. Like, do you have a clue what you're doing? Is it complete chaos all the time? Or you surround yourself with the perfect leadership team? What happens? Yeah, I. Um... It was, it was an interesting business because unlike every other business that I've seen that's in this world uh, and every other entrepreneur that I've ever met, especially the hundreds I met through Techstars or have, continue to meet through Techstars, there was never like a hockey stick growth thing. It, this is basic idea is like more content equals more page views equals more revenue equals more traffic, right? And that's never going to be like a hockey stick like people talk about, right? So it was a very, but it was super reliable because I just knew it was put this many pieces of content on the grid that, you know, it was just very much just more and more and more and more, more content begets more contributors, begets more page views. It was a very slow kind of thing. So it, and it, and it was, um, it was pretty operational. And so as we brought people in and we got to kind of where we had 20, uh, I hired a lot of, um, of people who were just really smart that could do a lot of things. And, you know, I had the guys that I pulled from the Rocky Mountain News, uh, Scripps Howard group. But then I got a bunch of people. So, like, went to MIT and got basically, you know, three people right out of the graduation line at MIT that lived in Denver that were kids that went to the Denver Public Schools because I'm a Denver Public Schools guy and was sort of like, come on, I got a job for you right over here. Brought those guys in and just started to really build sort of like a, a, a group of people that could do a lot of different things. Um, 
And, you know, I, I, I way overpaid people and I way over incentivized people in a, from an equity standpoint. Um, and I, I just really got a good culture of what was going. And we never, we're very fortunate to never have a massive kind of like disruption where we, you know, pivoted or changed the plan or anything like that. Like, um, but on the same note, we also suffered from the whole like not having something that was like, oh my God, it just it blew up in like an hour, you know. It was the kind of thing that people that were in the digital media business just kind of saw as like something that grew reliably and steady, you know. And it was, um, and it wasn't particularly sexy. We were filing a lot of patents and been doing a lot of real sort of platform stuff. So. And the culture was very much like, first we were, you know, uh, in, my, in my basement for a long time. And then we moved to random places in Cherry Creek where I would just sublet space from people that I knew or, or, or didn't know or whatever. And, uh, and really just built a, an awesome collection of people. I didn't have, um, I didn't really have any uh, attrition. And people were super focused, you know. Um, I don't think, as I see startups now, like, I don't think it was as, <laughs> I don't think it was as fun as, like, it looks now. You know, like, I mean, pe there are a lot of people in this town and all over that, they want to be at a startup or be involved in a startup because it looks like so much incredible fun and, like, the t-shirts and the stickers and the whole that kind of thing, like... <laughs> I guess it's, maybe it's because I wasn't that fun or we just all weren't that fun, but we were just more sort of like real grinders. The thing that ended up being the most like transformative part was after we started doing it for like a year, there became, and I don't know if you guys remember this, but there became this sort of thing where traditional media started to really push back on crowdsource stuff. You know, they're like, that's a fucking blogger, you know, and, you know, who, you, you know, we're, we're not bloggers, you know, and, and you have a bunch of bloggers and you have people writing opinion about what they think of the circus and they're just moms, you know, and, and we were like, that was really kind of like our sort of call to action, call to action was like, all right, well, I remember that we are going to, we're going to take these people downtown and we're going to show them, you know, and uh, we're going to show them that. It's whoever creates the content. Anybody can create the content. It's sort of like democratization, democratization of content. And, and it's open, right? And if, you're, if your content's great, millions of people go for it. And if they're not, it'll be bad. And if it's the only piece on the world in the world, they'll go to that because it's the only piece in the world. And if you want it to, to not, then go, build, then go write another one or make a video or an audio or slideshow of what's better. And we got really, really interested in... We called ourselves a people's media company after that because we got really interested in that. And there were a couple really big breakthrough moments that really sort of calcified who we were and what we, what we were really all about, you know. And the one that I remember most was when, when Virginia Tech happened in a room like this. Um, it was a big deal. And at that point in time, we probably had 200,000 contributors in our system. Um, and they were, they would cr create audio, video, text images on whatever topics there were. And it happened that when this thing happened, we had just launched our ability to message assignments out to people. It used to be that they had to come into the platform, log in and see an assignment. We had the ability to reach out to people and message them proactively. So as soon as that went over the line, the, the, the wire, I mean, we had in our database, we had one janitor from Virginia Tech, one TA, and one student. And so we messaged those three students, and or the, the janitor and the two others. And Within a matter of like five minutes, they were producing real-time content of what was going on at Virginia Tech. 
where at the same time, Reuters and Associated Press, all these people are putting dudes on planes and in rental cars to drive to Blacksburg to find the campus, to find where they were and all this sort of stuff. And we were, we were producing these sort of authority content on what the hell was going on in Virginia Tech, where the kids were, where the dorms were, what was happening, how many shots had been fired, the janitor. And there were, these three people are collaborating, creating a really incredible sort of mosaic of content from different perspectives, real time. And the next thing you know, it's like, gangbusters, right? And then soon after that, you had CNN launch, I report, and we sort of, bro we basically broke through. We broke through with news, which is, news is a, its own kind of thing, but then you just started to realize, like, um, you know, crowdsourced content had a, had a value. So along the way, you raised a pretty big venture round. Mm -hmm. How did that come together? Um, so again, when it came time to raise money, I did it on the, uh, on the people perspective. So at that point in time, uh, the money in was sort of angels. Uh, Ron was on the board. And Tim, my, uh, Tim Armstrong, was the, uh, he was the, uh, he was also on the board and an angel investor. And we started to generate a pretty decent amount of money on Google um, through AdSense, just like I sort of predicted. We didn't really think about the fact that we had a yield management system which would run the ads of whoever paid us the most, and that ended up being Google. And we started making a decent amount of money uh, running Google ads against our content. And um, so then people would start to say, oh, well, Tim's on the board, and he's running sales at, Yacht, at, at Google, so there must be some sort of conspiracy here because he must be sending all this money or all this money, like, at, at that point in time, wait, uh, wait. All this money wasn't all this money. Uh, but they were starting to get to be the sort of rumblings that Tim might have to drop off from the board if we were going to keep running Google ads because there might be this sort of conflict of interest, which was, uh, I guess, you could figure out a way to have game the system, but we, we definitely weren't doing that. So, um, so I wanted to make the most political move that I could make, which at that point in time, Google and Yahoo were very much uh, on different sides. So... Um, I went and looked at all of the board members at Yahoo that were, that were venture money in Yahoo. So I went right to SoftBank, uh, and the guy who was running SoftBank at the time was a, a, a crazy guy named Eric Hippo, and he was the chairman of the board of Yahoo. And I figured, well, if I have this Google guy, and then I put a Yahoo guy on my board, that, that will squelch any sort of conspiracy theory that associated content is, is sort of gaming the Google AdWords world. And so I went right to Eric Hippo and was like, I'm going to give you first look at this investment. And he was also invested in CNET and um, Huffington, Post. Huffington Post. Well, this is pre-Huffington Post, but he was big into publishing. He is, was invested in all sorts of digital media stuff. And so, and SoftBank was a good investor and they were in New York. And I was like, perfect. So then I have somebody, in, people in San Francisco and Bay Area and I'll, New York, if I can put this whole thing together. And so... Um, I got SoftBank and Eric really interested with Eric to sit on the board. And then you got term sheets from some other people just for negotiating um, sake, all Sand Hill Road folks. Um, and, uh, uh, and then raised uh, six and a half million dollars for, for my A round. Um, and uh, went through that whole rigmarole, did that, ended up raising three rounds, um, and uh, the second round was only SoftBank reinvesting again, uh, and then the third one we brought in a third investor for the C round, Canaan Partners, uh, who's also a big, you know, Bay Area digital media fund. So you've got a company that you built from scratch, and it really was a scratch your own itch business. Mm -hmm. um, you're having success and profitability. You've got a sense of mission. Wind us forward to the decision to sell it and what was going through the analysis there. Um, well, we had a lot of overtures along the way from different people who would say they wanted to buy the company. But because these, these media companies were, they were all media companies, they were in the process of sort of realizing like, you know, during the five years that we were in business, we started out with like crowdsourcing 
is bad. Those people don't write well. They've got bad spelling. Their cameras are shitty. They don't know what they're talking about, and they don't have the degrees that we have and all that to this pretty, you know, within four or five years, like, you got to have that, right? you got to have a crowdsourcing platform. And so along the way, we had lots of people coming to us, you know, crazy print publishers like Meredith Publishing who does, like, Better Homes and Gardens. And they'd hire a bank, and they'd come to us and say, hey, you know, we want to join the, the, this millennium and have this new product. And it's like, you don't even have websites. Uh, but, so we had a lot of people sort of look at, the, at this as like a thing for them to sort of digitize themselves or get involved in, in online media if they were print people. We had a lot of newspaper groups come, uh, come through. So there was always like a steady drumbeat of like, you know. But a lot of those people are on fishing trips just to figure out how to build the thing. Um, if they're going to build it themselves and the sort of build by going through a build by analysis um, for themselves um, and uh, and then it just got to a point where every it was starting to be that everybody had one you know everybody had a platform like this ours was definitely the best and we had a lot of patents so we had a patent on this assignment desk we had a patent on an algorithm so we, we wrote these algorithms because people would write on things Obviously, when we had a small team, people would write on things or, or, or create a video on things that obviously you had no idea about, right? So, like, I don't, I don't know what this is worth. I have no idea what a, you know, what this piece of knitting content is worth to people who are into knitting, you know? So we create these algorithms to that would automatically scan the scan the asset or the metadata if it was a image or a, a video, and, and 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 derive a value for that a lifetime value for that piece of content. So then it was really fail safe. It was like content publishing for to get from dummies to pu for, so dummies could publish, right? <laughs> um, and then they could actually just not even, they wouldn't, they'd never have to pay for things that weren't really worth it. It was a very good, it was a very good algorithm. It was plugged into, you know, ad values and distribution numbers and SEO and everything. It could really tell you what, what the lifetime value of a piece of content was. Um, which is very different for news versus long tail stuff and audio, video, different formats. So we started, we had a lot of that sort of stuff, like people kicking the tires, but then it still became pretty quick. People were just being able to just build the stuff their own, you know? And, um, and we didn't really want to sell the company, and I never ever started the company so that I could have a lot of money. That was never something that I, I always just wanted to have a job. Uh, and, um, but it became pretty quick that we had the best platform, but that everybody else was going to either start building it themselves. And a lot of people that we'd said, no, we don't want to sell it to, had, you know, and they, they knew they had to have it. So then they just start building it themselves. And they start looking at the number of people that could actually buy it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and then, um, then AOL came in and basically made, uh, gave us a term sheet. Uh, with a no shop on it, and they were a big publisher. We knew the big publishers who didn't have crowdsourced publishing at that point. We no, no shop meaning you could not go out to others right. and say, "What would you pay right. for this?" I couldn't, or yeah, I couldn't legally hire a bank who could then say, "Okay, they're willing to buy it for, you know, eighty million dollars or whatever," and uh, and we'll go see if we can get a higher bidder. It's you know, uh, and. Um, and in that was like a, a, a two or three months in the three month negotiation period, and they were so disorganized that it wasn't like the negotiations just didn't work out. They just literally couldn't like get meetings calendared, and it was just like <laughs> it was pretty insane. And the exclusivity period ended, um, and at that point in time. We, the very next day, I hired a bank, which is Allen and Company, because I was friends with Nancy Peretzman, who's one of the bankers at Allen and Company. And, um, and at the same time I signed with her, Yahoo came over and basically fired over a term sheet that was basically like 100% take it or leave it. And they were, they were probably, between AOL and Yahoo, they were probably two of the, five or six most likely people to buy it. And, um, and for me, it was basically 
a situation where I brought my entire company together and what, what well first we had the bankers try to make a couple, couple phone calls and it was I should have had a banker because the Yahoo guys literally did not negotiate on one single point not not even like things about people being handicapped and needing something else or I mean <laughs> we're talking about nothing um, and uh, and I said well you got to build an office in Colorado because we're not moving to Sunnyvale unless any of these people want to move to Sunnyvale but I checked and none of them do um, and uh, and and that was basically the only thing that I was able to push across the push across the table so then it was pretty simple as far as sell or no sell which was I just brought I mean I brought everybody together and basically we voted you know and you know, my investors were, it was pretty good because some of my investors were sort of like, oh, let's wait for a bigger number from some other else. Look, we've had two people want to buy it in a month, so there might be 10 by the end of the year. And then you had other investors who were like, this space is getting to be something that everybody has, and the time to sell it is now. Um, and, you know, we were starting to get, you know, bogged down in dealing with inquiries about that, you know. I mean, that's kind of a hard situation to be in is, people want to buy your company or you want to do an investment like you know people can be kicking the tires and wasting a lot of time but you still got to still gotta do it there's no way to get around it so and everybody was was psyched to do it you know um, I had everybody very very dialed into their equity and their ownership in the company um, from day one um, because like every other startup I couldn't pay them that that much um, and so I, you know, and now that I've seen it a lot from the other side as an angel investor and somebody who works with, uh, with a lot of startups, like I, I would say that I was probably 3x on equity for all my employees, for sure. So they were, they were very aware of that, you know. They a, lot, were, a lot of shrines to Luke in houses around town. <laughs> I don't know. But it's it's that was it was just a pretty democratic kind of thing. But it, there was enough interest constantly beating of, you know, Meredith and then AOL and different people that people kind of saw like that was going to be the end. And then when I realized like it was Yahoo, you know, we really cared about whether our contributors would have a good landing. Like that was the thing that when we when we decided not to have any more M and A conversations with Meredith. It was like we look, we had we had, a, we had basically over a half a million contributors at that point, and you know they basically made the whole company successful, right? If they didn't write and they didn't make videos and slideshows and stuff, we wouldn't even exist. And we actually did like a role playing thing of like, here's a group of contributors. You come in and you tell them that Associated Content is now owned by Meredith Publishing, and everybody was like, you know, it was like the biggest demotion ever. But we realized like. If we told all these people that they were now contributors to Yahoo and they'd get more page views and more traffic and more opportunity to get published and Yahoo was unique and that they had, you know, every, you know, home improvement, health and wellness, all these different categories, it was like it'd be a great deal for them. So that was, that was it. Let's spend the last 10 minutes before we do Q&A talking about Techstars and the experience you had at Techstars this yeah. last summer. Um, how did you get plugged into Techstars initially? What was the, what was the path to that? So I've been a Techstars mentor for... Uh, uh, a long time and uh, you know for me it was like you know it's the thing as an outsider before I even started mentoring like it was the thing that I never had you know like I can't imagine you know not having to just sit with me and one other person but sit with me and other people that are doing the same thing I, I mean the social part of it um, everything about it just seemed like exactly what the doctor ordered, right? I mean, a, a network of people, people who deeply and authentically care about the success of your business, but aren't like caring deeply and authentically about it because they've invested, but just because they care. Um, people who could, you could rally to get, you know, kind of feedback in a, in a, in a quickly. I mean, all those things about it were super uh, intriguing to me. Um, and I also always want to be involved in anything that brings Boulder and, and Denver closer together. So that went, that's why I started mentoring a few years ago. Um, and, uh, and I've, you know, I've always loved it. I mean, I think I'm, you know, 
Was there a mentoring experience that stands out to you as one of those, one of the companies that you worked with a couple of years ago that, you know, like it really clicked? Like this was it. This was the one that uh, was transformative. You know, almost every company I've worked with has gone out of business. <laughs> so for me, it's been just like the social, like some of the companies that I work with, some of those people are still like my very best friends, you know? And so I, love, I mean, I just love working with them. Like, uh, and so for me, it was, you know, I, I, I still work with them all, whether they're still at their startups or, or not. Um, you know? That's right. You're still around. That's, a, that's an outlier over there. That's a guy who threaded himself through all the bad advice, right? Uh, but, um, I, you know, I don't know. I think it's just, um, it's also a way to, for, for people to live vicariously through people who are starting something different, you know? And, and, and I think that's, that's, that's super fun. I think, um, you know, I, I think the opportunity to, you know, somebody who wants to, I, I want to help people out, but I also want people to help people out. A lot of people who want help don't really want to help themselves or do all the ditch digging work that it takes to, to, to earn some help. And I think if you've, if, if you're in tech stars, you're somebody who is, you know, committed to being a good listener, to, to, to taking advice from lots of people, to having good days, bad days, to maybe being told that you have a good idea or a bad idea or you should have a different idea. Um, and so, you know, Techstars also serves as, as somebody who's a mentor or, or even an employee. It serves as a layer to work with people who are really committed to being an entrepreneur in, in the right way, you know. At least on paper, your background as a teacher, you know, a coach and an entrepreneur seem to be perfect for that. What did you learn last summer that you didn't expect running the Boulder program? Uh, the first thing that I learned is that is that is the fastest way you can spend three months, for sure. So if you're in like a like a parole situation or something, that you're, <laughs> time is your enemy, and you just can't. Every day seems like an inordinately long. And you should you should get involved with TechStars because it goes unbelievably fast. Um, it's uh, a new market opportunity. We're so recruiting. <laughs> uh, the thing that I learned was uh, was they all have bracelets there, too, by the way. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Both alcohol consumption bracelets and where are you bracelets? Um, <laughs> is that you know I think as I've gotten older, I've I, I sometimes wonder whether or not there can be big groups of people, maybe international groups of people, who can rally around something in a very authentic, time-consuming way um, on a topic that they don't really necessarily care that much about, for people that they didn't necessarily individually screen out, and really commit to them and give them a lot of time and energy and and focus. And Techstars does that. I mean, it gets, the community of Techstars people, they take some random person like me, say, these are the 10 people, and people come out of the woodwork and grab those 10 people or the 30 people that make up those 10 teams and do everything that they possibly can to help those people. And it, they may invest in them, but the vast majority of them don't. And there's really nothing in it for them, you know? And they didn't pre-screen them, either on an individual level or on the, the topical level. Um, and it, it really gave me faith. The thing that I learned is that, like, it gave me faith that, like, people can rally around to help people that do something just so that they can live their dream, you know? And, like, sometimes you, I don't know, like, you can get sort of jaded to think that, like, would people do that? You know, like when I looked at what we were going to do for the summer at the beginning of the summer before I'd done it, I was like, are people really going to do that? Or am I just going to the phone all day begging some, can you please come over and talk to these people? Or, you know, like, because it's a lot, right? We're busy. We do a lot of shit. And, you know, and there's not, there's nothing in it. I mean, sometimes there's some old food laying around or, but other than that, I don't really have anything for you. And Brad's not always there to sign autographs and whatever. Um, <laughs> Uh, so there's that, and then the second thing is, is I really, 
I, I was I, I learned how quickly people can can ramp up and do something in a really exquisite quality way. Like when you work at big companies or you work in the when I say work, I don't mean at work, but just in your life, like you can see how people talk about you, you hear a lot of bullshit about how long everything is going to take and how many people it's going to take and how many emails, how hard it's going to be and all that sort of stuff, you know, and that's not really true, right? Like you can do a whole lot of things with a whole lot of people that require an insane amount of coordination very fast, you know, so this whole idea of like, you know, I mean, I guess do more faster is the is, is the mantra, but it's like it's you can do a lot of stuff in a short period of time with not many people, with not a lot of money, like, and it gives you sort of. I, I learned that that is like a real thing, you know, like somebody like Eugene there who coordinated the entire summer can get all of these people to do all of these things to produce all of these incredible outcomes. And it's not like a bunch of, oh, well, call me in a month, or we'll see about it, call me in a couple weeks, or oh, I'll get you that PowerPoint in four or five days. It's like, no, right now, for us, today. Like, that whole, you know, things don't need to be that slow, you know? And um, those are the main two things I'd say out there. Give us, give us one crazy moment, sort of an iconic moment from the summer that, you know, I, I know you have a long, long list of bizarre and yeah. crazy stories. Give us one to end on. Oh, man. The crazy, a crazy story of uh, what happened this summer. Um, the, <laughs> at, at the beginning, of, so like Techstars is sort of, you know, David and Brad and those guys who've started Techstars and, you know, there's, there's a sort of like a loose, <laughs> a loose framework of how it should be done. And, um, and that loose framework is just how other people have done it, right? There's not, there's no, like, there's no manual on how you spend day one, day five, day ten, day whatever. I mean, there's a, there's a demo day. Although I suppose you could probably convince people that you're not going to do a demo day. Um, but other than that, there's not a whole lot of structure, and uh, and then the people who are running in other parts of the of the world, they're not they're super interested in helping you out, but they're also very interested in you trying random things so that they don't have to try them. So they might not necessarily say that the stuff they're doing is such a good idea because you might have an idea to try something that they haven't had, which would be great to see you fail at that so that they don't have to do it, or see you do it really well and then they'll just do that next year, and so. The very first day, we bring everybody in, and these are people that are coming from, you know, France to all around the world. Um, none of them know each other, and a lot of the ones on the same teams don't know each other. I learned quickly, uh, and so it's just a, it is an incredible collection of flotsam and jetsam, mm -hmm. and you know, personalities, expectations. It's a pretty intense kind of thing, and so. Um, Eugene and I decide to take everybody up to this, what was the place called? Colorado Mountain, Colorado Mountain Ranch. Which, you know, I, I said I wanted to do some sort of like a, like a, some sort of an activity off-site that was sort of like icebreakers or something like that, but not icebreakers. And, and so we decided to do that. And so we put everybody on, on school buses. We had, a, we had a couple calls with these people at this ranch like the couple days before, and it didn't sound like they knew what they were doing. Like it was one of those, it was like, our, it was like us, right? The website looks great, and then you talk to them, and you're like, uh, and so, but it was kind of a one-shot deal too, right? Like we could have got up there, and it would have not been a good thing. And, you know, we brought all these people up there. Most of them never even met each other before, and we get in these rickety old school buses, and you know, go up the, the up the canyon here, and we do these ropes courses and, and and everything. And you know, it could have rained, it, it could have been unsafe. Probably was a little unsafe, but it could have been really unsafe. There's a million things that could have gone wrong. 
people could have thought it was a really bad idea. A bunch of people could have been handicapped. I mean, there could have been many, many things that would have made it so that it was just a bad idea. And it turned out to be a great idea, and everybody got along. And right at that point in time, I was like, this is going to be an awesome summer. And I knew that right that day, like halfway through that day. And that was the most, I would say, the most magical part of it. I'm sorry that doesn't end up making any money of the companies, but nope. uh, I was looking I was looking for magic. That's great. <laughs> but it was I was really great and you know um, yeah and I, we were just really glad that we took that risk and did it because that was the time when it was sort of knew it was gonna be it was gonna be great. We have a student affirmative action policy. So the first question goes to a student then we'll open it up. I think we go here first. Um, <clears throat> One of the things I noticed about a lot of entrepreneurs is that they're incredibly persuasive, and I think that's just so cool. I mean, so you at the beginning, you had to recognize news and just got some of the top talent and persuaded them to come work in your basement. I mean, what do you do to be that persuasive with people? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think you, I think, I don't know. I think some people, um, some people have the ability to get other people to take risks, you know, um, and um, and I think that what makes people able to to sell it is for people to feel like you're not doing it for them, right? That you're doing it, you know. This is like uh, this is like Ch uh, Charles Manson or something. Uh, <laughs> Branch Davidian style. Uh, you're not doing it for, you're not really doing it. You're not saying, come on over and, and help me out, right? Come on over and, and you, you have 50% of it and I have 50% of it. And everybody, I mean, like, make it so that it's like a thing where it's not really a top down kind of a thing. Um, where you're not sort of selling something, you're sort of saying like, this is this idea that I have and I think it's a good idea. Um, I think you have to ask, the. I think a lot of people can't sell because they don't ask the right people. Like in that situation, I asked people who were just about to get laid off and lose their job to go work at a startup, <laughs> where they could keep doing the same shit that they were doing for a business that was gonna be around for probably 50 more years than the one that they're working at, right? So um, I think it's about having a, having an opportunity for people to not really work for you or whatever, but like get involved in the same thing that you're doing and do it and make a bunch of decisions. You know, I think how you ask people to get involved uh, is a lot. And like, I think you give people the opportunity to, to have a huge responsibility is, 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 is part of the selling process. You know, um, say that you're willing to, you know, give over, you know, we have an acre of land and you can have a quarter of it. I'll have another quarter, and then we're going to find two other people, you know, and have that approach, I think, helps. I don't know. And I also think some people are just, you know, some people, you know, I, I, there are people who are just not really, you know, Brad calls it people collecting. You know, there's people that are just, that have really awesome ideas and stuff, and they're just not good at collecting people for whatever reason. And I, I think that means you're not going to be successful probably. At building a company that's got more than a couple people, you know, and build and be, you know, being a people collector is more than just collecting people, but it's also like, it's 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 giving what? I'm a people collector. Well, it's giving people face. like. <laughs> it's like yeah. It's about being able to also collect the right people who can who can some, one day be the CEO and then six months later be a head of product and then six months after that be a random engineer that's the least qualified person at the company but still be happy, right? You know, I mean, it's a lot of managing expectations for the right people. Like, it's not just, you know, you, I've seen people who are good at collecting really awesome people but not good at sort of moving them around, telling them we have to move to Grand Junction or we're going to get on a plane in five minutes and go meet, like, not flexible. So it's, it's people collecting and then sort of people sort of managing isn't the right word, but working with fluid expectations because that's just the reality of the deal. Yeah? So thank you for 
first for your talk. Um, one of the things that uh, made Associated Content so good is all the people. And he said, okay, right. million. can you just talk a little bit about how you incented them yeah. and uh, to come on board? Because that was a very neat thing. To yeah, so there were a lot of blog platforms, like Blogger. Google had released Blogger before we started. So there were ways to get published. But nobody was was uh, cutting people into the deal. So our whole thing was, we're going to pay you. And nobody paid people for their content at that point in time. It was sort of like, vol every, every blogger was a volunteer. you know. And our whole thing was, because we knew our numbers and we knew our business model, we knew we could afford to pay people and we would be the first people to do it. So all you had to do to contribute content was have a PayPal account. And we paid people every day at the end of the day, no matter what. And there was the times where, and we, we, had, we had that in the, in, the, in the, our, every time somebody gave us a piece of content, it was basically a stamped contract between us and you for that piece of content. And we told people, we pay them on a daily basis through PayPal. And for a lot of people, that meant you made $2 or 50 cents. Some people made, you know, hundreds of dollars. But if you produce news content, like those guys that are producing the content at, at uh, Virginia Tech, those people were the authorities with the most authority content on that day in news in the world. And those guys got paid like $5,000 that night, right? And so uh, it was a matter of like trying to not get people to work around an incentive program that was chips or, you know, everybody else was doing it was in, you can get a lot of respect on the web and you can be an authority and you can be, and we were just sort of like, you can just get paid, <laughs> you know? And we didn't, we, we, we called the company Associated Content as a joke because we couldn't come up with another name and it was sort of a play on the Associated Press. And if you, I don't know if you, any of you are old enough to have even gone to that website, but it was also brand free. It just said Associated Content at the top and it had your name and a link to your profile page, but there was no like lasers and phasers and drop downs. And I mean, it was written in tight font. It was as clean and as basic as you could get because we wanted the people to just be directed on like write awesome stuff in a completely unbranded environment. It's not, it's not liberal. It's not sportsy. It's not fashion. It's not anything. It's just these pages and they all look the same. And it's all about getting paid. And for a lot of people, only you know a third of the people didn't even sign up to get paid because they weren't. They were like dentists who somebody finally asked them to write an article about pediatric dentistry, and they were like, "Sure, on the web, fame, you know." And they would do it. Um, and then a third of the people never even claimed their verified their PayPal accounts and took the payments that were due to them. But so, but people understood that idea of we're going to pay you. And nobody, like the press, that really infuriated them because the media hates to cover the media, right? The media doesn't want to cover people that are disrupting themselves, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and we knew that uh, that way would just be sort of like, we'll pay them. And we pay them according to their performance. If you write, you can write as many poetry articles, uh, poets, or poems as you want. And if zero people look at them, you're going to make zero dollars and zero cents, but your stuff will be up there. And it'll be discoverable. And if somebody, like Better Homes and Gardens, wants to come in and license them, we'll license that out for you if you choose to agree to that. So the incentive program about building a community was going back to just a currency that we all know, which is currency. And even people who didn't want to get paid just appreciated that because they sort of understood that that's how we were going to operate, right? And you could log in, and it, you know, at that point in time, it isn't as good it is, as it is today with caching and things like that, but you could, at the end of the day, you could look and see exactly how many people looked at your content, and you could see how much that made you. And it was a very simple system, but that's how we built community, just by this idea that we paid people. Oh, we also did like, you know, meetups and t-shirts and all that happy stuff. When, but when you said you had that meeting for everybody to vote, how many employees did you have at the time? About 60. Yeah. Question back there. But if you get them to have to do so much due diligence work that they literally can't see straight anymore, you can pretty much get them to say what you want. So. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to the uh, money for the service people and then the We just put it right back into the queue and kept paying higher people at higher CPMs over time. We got to a point where it was like, a, well, first it was everybody got paid the same, and then we paid by 
what were then IAB categories in our the advertising bureau had different categories that had different sort of moving sort of CPM. So, you know, medical stuff had a higher CPM, and we'd pay those people more. And if you're writing poetry, you were getting <laughs> less than a penny uh, <laughs> for a thousand impressions because nobody wanted to be advertising against them. But, you know. yeah. Just kept bothering Nicole and Brad and everybody and asking if I could mentor. Now, how does an entrepreneur get? Oh, how does an entrepreneur? Go to techstars.com, check it out, um, pester the daylights out of people that work there, fill out an application, uh, and you know, have an awesome idea, have an awesome team of people, have an awesome team of people, and then maybe an awesome idea, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, I mean. Have at it. Two two other things. Apply early, so the yeah. like the Boulder program when the applications open, apply on the first day. It, it's amazing to me the number of people that apply between eleven thirty and midnight on the last day. <laughs> so view the application as an intelligence test. It takes about ten minutes to fill out, and mostly we're just making sure you have an email address and can read it and write English. Um, because then what happens is is you go through this. The application process is about sixty days long. You can.